Thank you so much for joining us online today. We so appreciate you checking out this message. Uh, we hope you enjoy it and are inspired to live more and more like Jesus Christ by His grace. If you would like to support the ministries of Rancho, you can do so at rancho.tv slash giving. Set up a giving profile and a reoccurring gift. We'd sure appreciate that. Enjoy. All right, going to give you a little bit of a, uh, of, a, of a, I guess, a summary of what we're going to do this morning. First of all, we are going to handle Romans chapters 9 through 11. If you are a student of the Bible and you maybe have done some studying of the Bible or you've read some books or gone to Bible school or seminary, um, you know that a sermon on Romans 9 through 11 is going to be a gnarly adventure. It is among the most difficult chapters in the Bible, among the most controversial chapters in the Bible. A lot of preachers skip this part when going through Romans, uh, and I was tempted to. I'm like, I'm just going to skip it, but no, we're not going to wimp out. We're going to just do it. But we're going to do it in a way... I think I could promise you that is gonna be really cool. So at the end, you're probably gonna think, why would he possibly skip this? But we're gonna assimilate it in a, in a way I think that will make some sense and have a good impact on us today. So just kind of brace yourself. If it's not so good, then you know why we can blame Romans 9 through 11. Uh, also, about 67% of the way through this message, we're gonna take communion together. So if you didn't pick up a communion cup on the way in, when we get there, just raise your hand and you'll have one. There's a section in Romans 10 that talks about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and we're gonna mark that moment through communion, the bread that represents the body of Christ, the juice that represents the blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus, the price he paid to get the message of God's grace to the world, we're gonna take in uh, and believe and receive that today through communion if you'd like to. So that'll be about 67% of the way into this sermon. But I'm gonna start with a, a little bit of a, uh, of, a, of a cultural reference here. Uh, with our guy, Elon Musk. When I say our guy, Elon Musk, that's tongue in cheek. Some of you love him, some of you don't. Whether you love Elon Musk or don't, he's got 107 million followers on social media. He's got, I wanna say more money than God, but that's gonna be sacrilegious here in church. $256 billion man. So when he speaks about an issue, the world just takes notice. Whether you agree or disagree, it's not the issue. The world takes notice. So. There's this little Twitterverse fight that was going on, just, you know, kind of on social media stuff, bantering back and forth about all the division that's in our world today, particularly in America. We are a bitterly divided country. It's an election season about every other month in America, so we're constantly fighting over elections. And it's coming up, you know, the midterms are coming up, so the tensions are getting higher. Everybody's fighting about everything. We have culture wars and political wars, religious wars. And so these comments started being made on, on Twitter that how do we get beyond this, right? We're kind of exhausted. We've had, you know, political fights and pandemics and heading into an election season and economic slowdowns and fears and, and everybody's tense. How do we get beyond that? Well, Elon Musk weighed in. He said just a couple of days ago, a new philosophy of the future is needed. Now, when he speaks, because of his wealth and Twitter followers and drama that always surrounds Elon Musk, people stop to take notice. And he usually says things that require you to think. A new philosophy of the future is needed. And when that word philosophy is used, it means that the deepest approach to everything has to be reevaluated. That's a bold statement. So as we're fighting up here, politics, religion, culture wars, his conclusion is the deepest approach to everything has to be changed. We need a whole new narrative. And then he detailed what his idea is. He says, I believe it should be curiosity about the universe, which he always capitalizes, and I'll let you think about that. Expand humanity to become a multi-planet, then interstellar species to see what's out there. Now, of course, this is a little self-serving because he owns a rocket company that's gonna take us to Mars. So, you know, okay, this is business, right? It's always business. But he's posturing it as a, as a philosophical change. We need to be people of curiosity. Then we'll have a new philosophy about the future that will unite us all. What do you think? Interesting. But I know Elon Musk is desperately waiting for me to comment on his Twitter, so uh, here it is. I agree with Elon Musk that there has to be a new philosophy about the future. I just don't think it is based on riding his rocket ships to Mars. I think that's gonna be great. There will be a human colony on Mars. He will take us there by 2050. It's gonna be very interesting, right? But here's what's gonna happen. We are gonna take the same divisions <laughs> here on planet Earth 
the same fights, the same accusations, the same bitterness, and we're going to do it in Mars. I guarantee we're, there's already a war brewing about the moon, right? China is claiming the backside, and we kind of got a flag on the front side. And I mean, already it's happening on the moon. It's going to happen on Mars. Our problem isn't that we're not a people of exploration. We are. We are a people of curiosity. That's always been the case. If there's a, you know, a new land that is, you know, a vast frontier, oh, we will be curious, and we will explore it, and we will take it, and we will do what we need to do for our benefit. We're people of exploration. I mean, it's Shark Week, for goodness sake. You turn on the TV, and we want to be curious about the depths of the sea, and we want to know every micro detail about sharks, right? It's a, it's a passion to be curious. So anything below and anything above, we want to send rockets as far as we possibly can and explore. It's not that we're not people of exploration. We are. It's just that we have a heart problem. We have a values problem. We have a character problem, right? We don't just need a new philosophy. We need a new heart. We don't just need a new philosophy. We need a new heart. And that's what the book of Romans is all about. Because the book of Romans was about divisions that were happening 2,000 years ago, roughly, you know, 53-ish AD in the city of Rome, the center of the Roman Empire. These two groups were fighting and fighting and fighting. And we've talked about them, the Jewish religious legalists and the Roman hedonists. They were all following Jesus, but they were not getting along. They hated each other. And they were ripping this church apart, Right? Not because they necessarily had a broken philosophy about curiosity, but because they've got a heart problem. We need a new heart. We need the heart of Jesus. We are better together and can unite together if we have a new heart, the heart of Jesus. That's the book of Romans. That's the book of Romans. Last week, Krista did a great job detailing this crescendo of Romans 8. Because Romans 1 through 7 talks about all the divisions in this church, and Romans 8 says, ha ha, you can come together based on some very exciting truths. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. Jewish folks who are judging the Romans and the Romans who are judging the Jews, you're fighting and fighting and fighting. Here's a new heart, the heart of Jesus. Know that there is no condemnation. God does not condemn you. Jesus came to deliver that message. That message cost him his life. He gave his life for that message. And once we know we're not condemned by God, then why, we, why would we condemn each other? He goes on to say in Romans 8, 14 through 16, for all, and get the words here, all and us and we, let's come together based on these truths for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Jews, Gentiles, we're sons of God together, right? By the Spirit of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. This very intimate, God is a Father, a perfect Father who loves us, always for us, has forgiven us. Jews and Gentiles together, we're part of the same family of faith. That's the new heart of Christ to know here, to know here that we're all together, all of humanity, part of the same family of faith, loved by God, forgiven by God, not condemned by God, so let's not condemn one another. The Spirit of God himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Here's the general theme here. If we all have a common story in God's unconditional grace, then we'll experience a common unconditional love for one another. That's the message of Romans in a sentence. As we're fighting each other over who knows what, culture wars, political wars, religious wars, if we can get that new heart of Jesus that says we all have a common story of God's unconditional grace, then we'll experience an unconditional love for one another. That's the new heart we need. So Elon, I know you're listening. <laughs> it's not about curiosity. We're a curious people, but it's about the motives and the values that underpin that curiosity. Is it about us and is it, is it about our perspective? It's about our beliefs and our political bents and our opinions, or do we need to have a new heart that says, I might just be here to serve you and not expect you to serve me. I just might be here to learn from you and not just tell you what you should believe and what you should do. Can we have that kind of sense of community that we're better together? 
So the Roman context of the first century church is very similar to the American context right here and right now, 2,000 years later. That's why the book of Romans is so vitally important for us to know and understand and read because today's problems are significant, right? We have political conservatives and political liberals who can barely be in the same room together. And honestly, we're at a point now where you can't even be in the same family together. Some families don't get together anymore, or at least don't get together as much anymore because of political divisions, right? We can be better than that. We can be better together. That requires a new heart. So many racial tensions, black and white, Hispanic, Asian, and native. Instead of uh, side-eyeing the other or assuming or stereotyping, maybe let's make a friend, right, with a different political bent. Let's make a friend with a different ethnic bent, and let's learn their story, their background, why their culture has so many beautiful things that we might not understand, but we can learn, right? That takes a whole new heart. It's a brand new heart. And, and the worst, I hate to say this, but the worst among us are Christians with different opinions. I mean, you want to see a fight? You want to see a social media knockdown drag out? Get two Christians who don't agree on something. I mean, they'll accuse each other of some of the worst things imaginable because they disagree on how to read a, a verse. It's insane, right? We need a new heart. That's what the book of Romans is all about. As Carissa mentioned last week, Romans 1 through 7 basically details the divisions. Uh, Romans are, are, are divided in their failures and the Hebrews are divided in their failures and they're accusing each other on their failures and the different perspectives and who's a child of God and how do we handle the scripture and all this, this reason why we are divided. Then Romans 8 is this beautiful crescendo of unity that just screams out, we're not condemned. We have no accusers. We're under the mercy of God. So let's be merciful to each other. The four questions that end Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? No one can be against us. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? No one. Who is there to condemn us? No one. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? No one. So if we're perfectly united with God, despite our failures, can't we be perfectly united with each other despite our failures? That's the theme of the book of Romans. Now, I want you to just imagine back in time, 2,000 years ago, the Jewish part of the church and the Roman part of the church, the hyper-religious part of the church and the kind of gluttonous, pleasure-seeking part of the church, right? They're both trying to follow Jesus together, and it's not working. So Paul is urging them, listen, both of you, there's no condemnation towards you. You're forgiven you're God's children. He's your heavenly father. Could you take that unity and start to love each other and learn from each other and stop accusing each other? Can you be a family of faith? And then you can sort of imagine the Jewish side nodding their head saying, yeah, we can probably do this in Jesus. The Roman side, yeah, we could probably do this in Jesus. But then the Jewish side of the room is really struggling. They're really struggling, even more than the Roman side of the room, because the Jewish side of the room has lost just about everything, in some respects, because of the Roman side of the room. The Jewish people used to have sovereignty over their land. Now the Romans have invaded and occupy and dominate and abuse the Jewish people. They lost their land. They lost their sense of identity. They lost their sense of nation. They lost their freedom because of the Roman side of the room. So they're really wounded. Not only that, here comes Jesus from among the Jews. Here comes Jesus and he says, you know what, world? You don't have to become Jewish to follow me. Just follow me. And you can be free from the Jewish scripture and the Jewish commandments and the Jewish priesthood and the Jewish temples and the Jewish prophets. You can be free from that. Just follow me. Not on a whole series of hundreds of commands, but under one command to love your neighbor as yourself. You can follow Jesus without becoming Jewish in tradition and religion. And the Jews were heartbroken by that because their entire life, their entire identity is based on their scriptures, their 10 commandments, right? Their law, their temple, their priesthoods, all of it. And here comes Jesus, then the apostles saying, that's not for everyone, that's for you. That's good, embrace that. But everyone else is free. They lost their nation. They lost their sovereignty. They're losing their identity. They lost their freedom. And now they're a part of this movement called Christianity where their laws and traditions do not apply. They can choose to follow that. Fantastic. That's beautiful. Knock yourself out. But that does not apply to the new church. 
They were grieving their loss. So I want to just imagine a scene here. It's baseball season. Any baseball fans? Yeah, I didn't think so. Um, so imagine a scene. I, there's been a couple of gnarly brawls uh, <laughs> during this baseball season. And whenever I hear people say, hey, did you see that brawl in baseball? I'm like, what, a bunch of grown men pushing each other in the chest? It's like, no, this one was for real. This is about a month ago. Pull it up. It's like, yeah, okay, that's a fight. So imagine pitching goes towards the batter's head. It's the third time it's happened, and it's on. Bench clearing brawl and fist being thrown. That's how I fight like this. <laughs> goes so well. Fist being thrown, and uh, umpires are trying to get in there, kind of sp spread it apart. You know, okay, guys, 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 all right. Two sides having a brawl. That's what was happening in first century Rome. Greeks, Jews, brawling each other, accusing each other. The apostle Paul, the umpire, stepping in saying, guys, 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 enough, enough, enough. Now, the, the ones who lost that fight are the Jewish people. They are, they're bruised and bloody, they, they lost. Again, the Romans, they're the powerful ones and they dominate their land and all, and even this church community they're a part of is not following their traditions, they've just lost. So imagine the umpire coming alongside the Jewish people and said, listen, you're a mess, I get it. Romans over here like, yeah, I'll show you what's up. These people are really, they're down, they're lost, they're depressed. So the apostle Paul pulls them aside, writes them a mini book called Romans 9 through 11. It's a mini book. It's right in the center of, Romans, uh, of the book of Romans. And it's for all to see, but the apostle Paul pulls this group aside and with compassion and empathy, he says, listen, I know you're not feeling like it, but you're a really big deal. You really are. You're a big deal with a proud history, and I wanna tell you about it. And have you seen the, uh, <clears throat> the movies uh, Anchorman? Anchorman, right, Ron Burgundy? The world passed him by. The world passed him by. He was feeling irrelevant. He wasn't feeling wanted anymore, and he so desperately wanted to feel wanted. And so one part of the movie, he says, I don't know how to put it, but I'm kind of a big deal, right? Very famously. I think there's a slide on that one that's very funny. Here it's, there it is. I'm kind of a big deal. So he's feeling beat up. You know, the, 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 the news anchor is the person of the past, and the, this whole new team's coming in, and he so wants to be a big deal, but he's feeling the weight of being irrelevant. The Apostle Paul pulls the Jewish congregation aside and says, listen, you're a big deal. And he didn't say that in a condescending way. He wasn't just pacifying them. He says, listen, eye to eye, I'm going to detail to you, Jewish believers, why you are such a big deal. And he starts with Romans 9, verse 4. Israelites, to them belong the adoption as children of God. So they're bloodied and bruised and they're going, yeah, God called us first to be his children. That's kind of cool. To you belong the glory of God. Yeah, our history says the glory of God was shining in our tabernacle and temples. To you belong the covenants, right, the promises. To you belongs the law, the Ten Commandments, you know, written by the finger of God. They're like, yeah, that's kind of cool. That was to us, right? To you belong the worship and the promises that God gave to you and then to the world, right? Israelites, to them belong the patriarchs. This is Abraham and, and, and Isaac and Jacob, the big guys, right, that started this whole thing. And from you belong their race, and according to the flesh is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. You see what the Apostle Paul is doing? Jewish believers, look at what God has done through you. That's an incredible list. God has done so many great things. And, and the best of it all is that through your race and through your religion, God gave us Jesus, the Savior of the world. This is remarkable. I know this doesn't feel good right now, and I know the world has passed you by, and, and you love your people and love your religious practices, and yes, the world has moved beyond that and is free from that, but you're a big deal, and love your heritage, and love your tradition, love your religious practices, but don't be angry towards others who don't follow them. It's a full-throated message to the Israelites and to the world, how cool is it to be a Jewish person? in the Jewish community who has such a rich heritage. But then he says, hold that with humility, not, a, not arrogance. Romans 9, 15 through 16. Hold it with humility, not arrogance. For God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and compassion on whom I have compassion. So then my calling does not depend on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. 
So the apostle Paul says to the Jews, yeah, you're a pretty big deal, but just know it wasn't because you deserved it. You didn't like earn the right for God to choose you first. God is just merciful on whom he's merciful. And in his mercy, he just chose to start with you. And so they might, you know, in their downtrodden state, go, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a big deal. We're the biggest deal. We're better than you. No, Paul's putting a lid on it. He's saying, yes, you're a big deal, but it's by the mercy of God, not because you're better than them, not because you're right or good or moral or whatever. It's just God chose to work with you. So yes, be proud of your heritage. It's fantastic. But hold that with humility. Never lord that over anyone. And then be excited that through you, God brought Jesus. He brought Jesus, the Savior of the world. And Paul does a little sidebar here, and he grieves the fact that so many Jewish people did not receive the Savior that came from the Jewish race, right? And so Paul says, he says this, that this one who would come through the Jews will become a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to the house of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, right? And so what the Apostle Paul is, is saying is, listen, so many of my Jewish sisters and brothers are not following Jesus. They've stumbled over Jesus. So the one who, be, who was the rock of salvation is the one who the Jewish people are stumbling over. They're just not getting it, and they're not receiving it. And the Apostle Paul says that's breaking his heart. In fact, in Romans 9, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, I would rather be eternally condemned so that my people, the Jewish people, would follow Jesus and believe Jesus and enjoy the grace of God through Jesus. But they're just not right now. They're not right now. So the Apostle Paul says, primarily to the Jewish audience, you know, in Romans 10, verse 9, he says, but if you, house of Israel, if you will, will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. You see what he's saying? The Jewish people were feeling the shame of not being in front. They were feeling the shame of not having their nation, of not having their sovereignty, of not being in charge of even the church that they started. Keep in mind, the church in Rome started by Jewish followers of Jesus. Then Rome and their injustice kicked all the Jews out of Rome, and so the Romans took over the church. Five years later, the Jews were allowed back into Rome, and they don't have their church anymore. It's like, oh, that was my seat. I was on that council, and now there's a Roman there. And the Roman's saying, yeah, it's our church. But we started it, but it's our church. They were feeling the shame of this. They didn't have their nation. They don't have their sovereignty. They don't have their, their free will. They are oppressed. They don't even have their church. They're forced to now sit in a church under Roman authority as they were sitting in their nation under Roman authority. And they're feeling the shame of that. And the Apostle Paul is calling them, if you believe in Jesus, it's not gonna make everything right and good but it's gonna allow you the pleasure of knowing God's grace is on you. It's gonna allow you the pleasure of knowing that through your heritage, through your bloodline, through your religion, God brought to the world the savior of the world and you can be satisfied in that. There can be a humble gratitude in that. Then Paul says in Romans 10, 12, and we'll share communion, he says that in Christ, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That salvation is knowing the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Knowing how loved we are. Knowing that we're forgiven of everything, past, present, and future. God is a father who looks at us and embraces us as his son, as his daughter. He says, you are mine. Yes, you're not perfect, but you don't need to live in the shame of that. Jew and Gentile, there's no distinction. We can be one in Jesus, part of the same family of faith. We're about to take communion now. If you don't have your communion cups, just raise your hand, and I think somebody will be around to help you out with that. But take that um, thin piece of plastic off the top and, and grab that piece of bread. And again, if you don't have a communion cup, just, just lift up your hand. Take that piece of bread and break that bread. Jesus says, when we take this meal together, know that this is my body broken for you. Jesus Christ gave his life for you. 
He was so committed to showing you the grace of God that his life was sacrificed, his body was broken. So take that and eat that in remembrance of Jesus. And then take the juice. During the Passover meal, it was the wine of the Passover celebration that symbolizes now the death of Jesus Christ. His blood was shed for you. He sacrificed his life. He sacrificed everything to show you the depth of the love of God. So take that juice and drink that in remembrance of Jesus. We share this communion once a month. If you're not yet aware, it's the last Sunday of every month. This is the meal that unifies us all. This is the meal that unifies us all around the table of Jesus, around the grace of Jesus, around the loving sacrifice of Jesus. And in Christ, there is no distinction, Jew or Gentile. In Romans, this was the fight, Jew and Gentile. Now there's a fight between conservative and liberal and black and white and Hispanic and Asian and native. This is a fight that's religious, it is cultural, it is political, and in Christ we can come together. In Christ we can be a united family of faith, we can. Is it easy? It is the hardest thing, one of the hardest things on earth, to get people from different backgrounds and different perspectives and different opinions and different experiences together as a family of faith. It is so incredibly difficult. So Paul is, is talking to the Jewish legalists, the, the hyper-religious people, and saying, listen, God values you and he loves you, but you gotta be nice to the Romans. He looks to the Romans and he says, listen, I know the religious people are on your case and they're judging everything, but could you value their contribution to what's going on here? So Paul talks to the Gentiles. He says, now I am speaking to you Gentiles in Romans eleven thirteen. 13. This is the Gentile part of, Paul, of Paul's message. He says, you might have overheard me talking to the Jews, how big of a deal they are. How, how God used them in that time and that place to, to bring forward even the Savior, Jesus Christ. So treat them well. And then he goes on to say something very powerful. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. What? Where did this? Uh, uh, it, <laughs> if the dough is offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. What in the world? Well, I'm gonna show you what in the world. Give me a few minutes. I think this is gonna be kinda cool. All right. I am not a baker. There's the disclosure. But I brought, some of you are gonna have to help me out like real time here. This is starter dough, sourdough bread. Okay, starter dough. Anybody know what starter dough is? I didn't until yesterday. Okay, all right, some of you are getting real excited. I may get this wrong, and I know you're going to be, if I get this wrong, I'm leaving this church. So uh, I'm going to try to be careful. I, I got some counsel on this, and last service helped me out as well. There is what's called starter dough, and that is kind of your initial sourdough bread dough. <laughs> so far, so good. And some starter dough has existed generation upon generation in families. There are families, from what I hear, this is unbelievable to me, but who actually take their sourdough and pass it from one generation to the next. And sometimes, like, like hundreds of years, multiple generations passing on starter dough. Some of you are like, this is disgusting. No, it, it, it's cool. You go to sourdough bread companies, I think San Francisco, their starter dough is, I don't know, 100 and some years old. And then what you do, and this again sounds kind of gross, but you feed it. This is kind of an alive thing. And you feed it. And as you feed it, you build it, and then take a bit of it and bake a loaf of bread. Am I good so far? Okay, I'm, I'm looking at my people. But then you still have your starter dough, and then there's some kind of, I don't know, you throw away some stuff, who cares? So, um, but this, the Apostle Paul says, is Israel. Israel is the starter dough. God started with Israel, and he made a cool little, little lump. It says lump. He made a cool little lump, and he handcrafted the nation of Israel. He handcrafted Abraham. We're starting with you, through you, we're gonna build a great nation, and through you, all nations are gonna be blessed. And Abraham's like, wow, this is really cool. God makes a starter lump in Israel. And they're very happy with that. For 1,500 years, mas o menos, 1,500 years, there was that starter lump. 
And then God started feeding the starter lump. And they're like, what are you doing? God's like, yep, we're working. We're gonna grow this thing. We're gonna expand this thing. And they're like, I don't think so. We don't like this. God feeds it and feeds it. Romans, you can't, they occupy us. They crucify us. And you're feeding the Romans in our starter lump. You've gotta be kidding. And we're feeling like this is not working. And their traditions are getting mixed with our traditions. And we have this Roman church that's both Jewish and Roman. And God's feeding the starter lump. He says, I'm baking some bread and we're gonna feed it again in Rome and in the Germanic barbarians and in Africa and in Asia. He keeps feeding the lump of the nation of Israel where he started. And there is a bit of the nation of Israel through Jesus in every single loaf of bread. Here we are in Temecula, the furthest place away from Israel where it started, and God is still making bread through the starter lump of Israel. Make sense? It's kind of cool, right? Now, you know, God is like, I started, oh, this is worse than I thought. God, okay. God says, I'm starting with Israel, right? And I love these people, and I will never stop loving these people, whether they believe me or accept me. And, and Paul is lamenting, most have, rege- I'm making a mess, most have rejected my Savior, but listen, there's still hope here, because through that starter lump, I have fed it and fed it and fed it, and all the world is receiving this gospel of Jesus Christ. And all the world knew gracious things were happening because I started with Israel. I want to wipe this on my pants, but it'll just be very bad if I do that. So uh, anyway, some of this stuff doesn't go, go well as I planned. But listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans eleven twenty five. He says, right now, a partial hardening has come upon Israel. So he's recognizing that the lump I started with is largely not following Jesus. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. There are loaves of bread, there's fruitfulness coming in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, later in verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Listen to what God is saying to the Jews who are beat up and bruised and the world has passed them by. You are a really big deal, but hold that with humility because it's only by God's mercy. But know that through you, the starter lump that God handcrafted, there is his grace that is going everywhere, including Temecula and Marietta. It's gonna go everywhere, right? Everywhere. Take great pride in that, Jews. And Gentiles, always be grateful for the Jewish people. Always be grateful for the Jewish people. We're free from following their law. That was God's time and God's place with them first. You're free from following that law. And yes, you're free to follow Jesus and free to follow his command. And his command, which he says wraps all this up, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. That's really what you gotta worry about. Be free, but never judge them. Never judge them for their law and their heritage and their traditions and their feasts and their festivals. Never judge them. That is beautiful. And God used them mightily. God used them mightily. Here's where I want to land all this today. And I'm, I'm really serious at this moment. Millions of American Christians are feeling as passed up now as the Jews did 2,000 years ago. The Jewish people 2,000 years ago had their land, had their territory, had their kings, had their moment, had their boundaries, had their wealth, had their temple and priesthood and prophets. They were dialed in for a period of time that they always looked at and says, that's kind of what we deserve, we think. And they lost it all. And they were feeling beaten and bruised and left behind. And the Apostle Paul in this mini book of Romans 9 through 11 is encouraging them and comforting them and allowing them to feel the pride of what God did through them and continues to do through Jesus who came through Israel. There are millions of Christians right now who feel equally passed up. I'm gonna put this on the head of a pin. In the 1980s, in some 90s, um, there was a Christian movement that I grew up in that had it all. We had our politicians, the time of church growth almost unlike any other time in American history, probably a third wave of church growth. 
Churches were growing like weeds. There was this moral majority that kind of stepped up and said, we're gonna institute kind of Christian principles and be a Christian nation, and they tasted it. I grew up in that. And I'm just calling it this morning for the world to know. (laughs) The world has passed them up. The world has passed them up. And they are sad. Some are angry. The world has passed them up. The Christian movement is passing them up. The Christian movement is passing them up. The Christian movement is starting to just explore, is it possible that following Jesus is for everyone? That following Jesus is not super clean, like you do this, you do this, and this, and this. It's a relationship, it's a story that we're all involved in. Is it possible that a church community can have wide open doors and everybody is welcome? With all of our backgrounds and perspectives and opinions and culture, can, can, a, can everyone come into a church and be treated like family? Or are they gonna get nitpicked? Are they gonna get judged? Are they gonna get looked down upon? Is it possible that a church can look very much like the ministry of Jesus? Is that possible? The Christian movement is asking those questions. And it looks a whole lot different than a lot of people grew up with. There's a grief and sometimes there's an anger there. And listen, I understand it. I went through that grief and I went through that anger and I was boxing the air because I was fighting it along the way and then you know, God kind of put me in a full Nelson. It's like, no, you probably should pay attention. Look to Jesus first, not the religious heritage. Look to Jesus first and not necessarily how you grew up. Look to Jesus first, simplify life here and just say what Jesus did, let's try to do how Jesus taught, let's try to teach Let's fling doors wide open and say everybody is welcome and will be treated like family. And then when we leave, we want to love everyone and treat everyone, Romans will say here in a couple of weeks, as even better than ourselves. Is that kind of community possible? There are Christian movements that I like to consider ourselves a part of that are asking those questions and working really hard to make that a reality. It is among the most difficult things on earth. To have a church, look to the left, look to the right, as Haley said, and say, you know what? We're different. We come from different backgrounds, different religious perspectives. We have different opinions. Republican might be sitting next to a Democrat, and a Democrat might be sitting next to a Republican. And you can look at each other with a smile on your face, say, brother and sister, let's walk this together. I can believe the best in you. I don't have to accuse you. I'm not nitpicking everything about you. I want to befriend you. I want to learn from you. I want to learn from you and grow as a person. It's going to be difficult at times, but it's going to be fun. And I'm going to choose to have that new heart. It's hard. The easy thing, which is happening right now, is a great religious migration within the Christian church that says, I'm going to go where I'm comfortable. I'm going to go where everyone believes the same thing and pretty much everybody comes from the same place. And we're gonna pat each other on the back week after week that we are the ones who have it right, but I feel safe and I feel good. This is my church. Listen, I understand that. I totally understand that. I understand the need in a chaotic society to have a moment of peace for an hour on Sunday (laughs) without having to think too much, without having to stretch too much, and without having to get to know someone that I'm gonna have trouble getting to know. I understand that. I don't think that's best. I think the path that Paul is trying to lead the Roman church in and trying to lead us in today by the Spirit of God through this wonderful book is to say, you know what, it's worth it. It's worth taking an hour on Sunday, live or online, it's worth taking an hour and maybe we're gonna be stretched a little bit and maybe I'm gonna think a little bit and I'm gonna see a perspective maybe I didn't grow up with and I'm gonna be sitting next to someone who I wouldn't naturally associate with, but it's gonna be fun. I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna grow. They're gonna have an impact on me. Who knows, I might have an impact on them, but together we are going to impact the world around us because a unified church will be so powerful. This is John 17 and the entire book of Romans. A unified church will be so powerful, the world will look at this place and go, wow, how is that kind of unity possible And all of these different kinds of people from all these different kinds of places are unified in Christ, unified in the cause of Christ, doing a lot of good together for our neighbor, doing a lot of good together for people in need. And this is our family of faith. And let's go. Let's go. 
That's the book of Romans. And I am hopeful that Rancho Church, to tip my hand a little bit, will be more successful than the Roman church was. Because the ending here is difficult. I'd like to think that the principles here applied at Rancho Church is gonna mean a bright, shining light, not only for this community, but for this region, and in so many ways display the love of Christ at work through us. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we uh, thank you so much for your love, your grace, your mercy in our lives, the powerful work that you're doing among us and through us to unite us in Christ despite our differences. We can be humble enough to be thankful for the work that you've done in our lives, humble enough to serve one another, humble enough to learn from one another, and humble enough to grow together and do a lot of good in the name of Jesus. Teach us to follow him well with humility, grace, and gentleness. In Christ's name we pray, and everyone said, amen.